Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 334 of our TIG Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Leading Lyme, an interview with Dr. Kent Holtorf. Dr. Holtorf and his two brothers were all born with Lyme disease from their mother. Throughout their lives, they had terrible anxiety, fatigue, depression, and they kept being told by doctors they needed to sleep more, exercise more, or simply relax. Dr. Holtorf fought against the symptoms and went to medical school and became a doctor. Eventually, he was diagnosed with Lyme disease, Babesia, Bartonella, and a number of reactivated viruses and mold toxicity. As he discovered the treatment protocols that worked for him, he opened up centers to treat patients that were going through similar issues. Eventually, he formed Holtorf Medical Group, which is a world-renowned treatment center for Lyme disease, and many of our past podcast guests have treated there, like our good friend Danny Tiger. Today, Dr. Holtorf is training other doctors about the reality and severity of Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. He's been featured on a wide variety of news platforms like CNBC, ABC, CNN, Extra, Discovery Health, The Today Show, ESPN, The Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, US News and World Report, US Weekly, Forbes, Cosmopolitan, New York Daily News, and so many more. Dr. Holtorf is also the founder and director of the nonprofit National Academy of Hypothyroidism and Integrative Sciences. In his brilliant podcast episode, you're going to get a behind the scenes look at Dr. Holtorf, his transition into a Lyme literate medical doctor that's world renowned, helping many people in California, and exactly what he's doing today to help his patients. So without further ado, here's Dr. Holtorf in Leading Lyme. Hello, Dr. Holtorf, and welcome to the Tick Boot Camp Podcast. Thank you. And as I mentioned, you guys have the best name out there. So uh, uh, that's awesome. You're doing great service. So I, I thank you. Well, thank you. And, and, and I want to uh, extend my thank yous to my good friend, our good friend, Daisy White, who's agreed to uh, co-host with me again. So I guess I wasn't too bad last time, Daisy, because you agreed to come back and uh, join me again. Yes, I'm very excited to be in your midst again. And not yeah. just Daisy anymore, Rich. This is going to be the first ever interview we've done with a special guest co-host and you and I with the brilliant Dr. Holtorf. So we are really excited tonight. This is the first one with a special need. Yes. <laughs> and I can attest to that because <laughs> That's what I, said. I'm taking over your treatment. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I happen to be Dr. Ken Holtorf's patient advocate. I have the great privilege of that. And of course, Dr. Double edged sword. It's a double edged sword, yes. And I can um, state that many things, many podcasts, many interviews, many things out there about um, Kent as a doctor, Dr. Holter was a doctor, and the brilliance of what he's yes, brought don't believe him. to the Lyme community <laughs> and to patients at large. Um, Kent and I have collaborated immensely on, on multiple patients um, over the years. <laughs> yeah, thanks for those wonderful celebrities. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Kent and I have worked a lot together, but what I'd like to say and, and what I'd like to lead with and how I'd like to begin this is that I know him well as a patient, as a Lyme patient. And um, his journey is one that I think can be really helpful to many people. Um, it's also extremely interesting. He's been through many, many incarnations of treatment. And I'm very excited to help um, the community understand Kent as Kent the Lyme patient. And so this is my intent today is to give um, voice. No, it's weird. I don't have that wall that I can just start no, spewing scientific I'm here facts. To help give voice to Kent, the human, the patient, the Lyme patient. And so I'd like to begin without further ado to ask about where you live. Who's asking? I'm asking. Are you a cop? <laughs> uh, I'm asking you where you live. I live in Redondo Beach, California. Okay. And um, have you always lived in Redondo Beach? Have you always lived in California? Uh, I grew up in Huntington Beach. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, stayed in, went to Berkeley, then UCLA, and then to St. Louis for medical school. And the farthest east I'd been before that was Vegas. Okay. So I show up, I'm like, wait, what's this white crap, you know, are we supposed to go to school on this? You know, like, it's crazy. But uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting, a little different uh, flavor out there. So, um, but you grew up here and your family's from here and you were 
you were uh, an only child. You had siblings. No, uh, uh, two other brothers. Uh, oldest brother, uh, six four, full head of hair, good looking. Don't know happened to me. Well, I do kind of knew what happened. But uh, football scholarship to Stanford, dated Heather Locklear, like just had everything going from got accepted to UCLA Film School, but kind of never worked a day in his life. And he got drafted and then just kind of uh, drug stuff. And then he passed away. Um, and I'm sorry. My middle, my middle brother. And that was recent, right? He passed away recently. Um, Not so uh, a couple years ago. A couple yeah. years ago. Yeah. And and when we were talking about Lyme transmission and in utero, I know, like, I know I had it my whole life. And like my mom, we just called her the sweating machine. Like she would just sweat like crazy. And, uh, and she had a lot of addictive behaviors, but she didn't drink. And, um, and then my dad had chronic fatigue syndrome before there was chronic fatigue syndrome, you know? And I go, like, oh, what's your lazy? I'll go exercise that, that type of thing. And then my middle brother is just a hopeless uh, mental illness, um, you know, drug addiction. And I think that really affected. And I was, and my mom, when I was born, actually in Castro Valley, um, she was doing like uh, dexedrine to keep her weight down and smoking five packs a day. And surprise, surprise, I was born at 24 weeks. So I was either supposed to die or be retarded. So you can decide which one it is. Um, and the Kennedy kid was in the hospital and he got the incubator. So I got the old being bagged for like two months, but it turned out the incubator gave him too much oxygen and they died. But, and I was just reading like studies on like, if you don't have immediate skin to skin contact with the baby, like you lose like, you know, 30, IQ points. So I could have been almost normal. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, she was not self deprecating yeah, at and, all. And, uh, and uh, she had a daughter who died uh, previously. So she just left the hospital because she didn't want to know of me if I wasn't going to come home. You know, so uh, I'm not mad at that. I mean, it's very understandable. But um, I thought my, you know, people can ask me about my childhood. I'm like, I think it was normal, but maybe some of those things aren't quite normal. Right. I mean, we don't know what's not normal. And what's normal is what's normal for us when we're going through it until yeah. we can compare notes later. And your um, everyone's uncle didn't sleep with me? No, oh, that's okay. not a common thing. <laughs> to be. So, that was told so tell me, when when you were living, I mean, obviously, your mom went to pick you up after a few months and you did grow up in your so family <laughs> so you did have a, a normal family life right mm -hmm. and so and you were the youngest obviously of three boys and how and how you know what were you asp aspiring to when you were a young boy or teenage boy did you always want to be a doctor ever since I can remember Okay, right, which is kind of weird, but uh, filling out the aptitude tests and like they do in high school and it says what you should be, I should be an underwater welder. And I'm claustrophobic. I hate the water. It's like, okay, okay. you know, but no, I, I come up with that. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I just like for some reason you remember these these weird things and had a very good, you know, basically high school experience and you know uh captain of the sophomore football team academic athlete of the year valedictorian but then they took it away from me because my speech was a little condescending i guess and um but my brother was he stuttered he was overweight and it which makes me nothing against all the pe teachers and the teachers out there but they would make fun of him and like, and they would like bring me to the front of the line and just treated him like dirt. And I just resented it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, a lot of things have, but I think that was one of the things just killed his self-esteem. Um, and he's- This is your eldest or uh, your middle? Middle, middle. No, the eldest one in confidence like crazy. Okay. 
So do you think that there is something about being your middle brother's younger brother that, you know, propelled you to want to help and heal and take care of people? Was that something? No. I said, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. Like, he okay. gets arrested, but he's arrest proof because, like, he passed out on a bus and someone took his cell phone. And so he got woke up and kept everyone getting off the bus. And the bus, they have like a button and the police immediately come. So they arrest him for holding hostages and stuff. And they're taking him in and he's so irritating. They pulled over and they said, get the hell out. <laughs> like, so okay. it, it's like. Um, okay, so that was not an impetus for you. So what is what is it that, you know, gave you the inspiration, the aspiration, the dream? I kind of did a calculation who would get the most chicks and drugs. Okay. <laughs> but no, I'm I'm kidding, but kind of. But um, no, it's just always something I that that's what my passion was. I love I love science and um and just kind of that's what I figured I'd be. I don't know how much of my parents influenced, but um like my mom's had a lot of great advice. Like you're like, oh, this is hard. Well then just quit. And so I would go against that, but my middle brother unfortunately took that advice all the time. It's quite a dynamic. So, and also, I remember you and I've talked about this. So, your mom was like a very heavy smoker. Yeah, they all had both of them, like five packs a day. And, and they were not necessarily well either. Uh, no, again, my dad was, was sick and they had a baby who died, which, you know, I don't blame them at all, but I, I'm sure it was from, you know, the secondhand smoke, but probably also with the mattresses in those days putting the kid on their back, you know, but they lost a child, which is the most, the worst thing that can, I think a parent can go through and it totally changed them, you sure. know? Okay. And then they thought my middle brother was the re, he looked just like her, was a reincarnation of, um, uh, of Andrea. So she goaded over him, anything go, I just stole $500 out of the register. If you don't come uh, put in, I'm going to jail. She's, you know, uh, right down there. And I didn't know until after my mom died that we were Mormon. But my mom, <laughs> after the... Uh, How does know, that happen? Yeah. That's kind of an and after the daughter died, she said, there is no God. God wouldn't do that to anyone. And then my dad, who was atheist, turned to Christianity, you know, to help him deal with it. So we grew up as Christian. I, I do want to ask, did you, did you learn anything about Lyme disease, tick-borne illness? Were you aware of these health issues that existed all around you? And it sounds like that you were born with Lyme and had congenital Lyme. Or was any of this on your radar as a young child, yeah, so, even into your teenage years? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I had no clue of Lyme. Like, and in those days, you know, we didn't have computers, we didn't have anything. And I just remember like in college and, you know, basically going to to the uh, medic, uh, the university library, finding the journals, getting the photocopy. And so it was really um, information was a scarcity and a value. Now we get too much information and you got to filter through what's, what's basically right or wrong. But what started happening like through high school, like one pupil is always bigger than the other. Um, like one half of my body be sweating, the other one freezing. My left arm would stop working for a while, and you know I couldn't find anything. So I, I know I had I had something, and oh, for Reynolds like crazy, I couldn't shake hands. And then I it I also have kind of a theory of Babesia and drug addiction, like with my brothers, um, uh, both of them, but. That's why I really think that kind of in utero is is much more prevalent than I think is felt, you know, that is generally agreed upon. And so when can, I mean, I, I, you know, I know that you started having these symptoms. Can you talk about how they started to progress to a point where they started to accelerate to a point where then somebody, you know, was there was a more acute version of what you were going through yeah and i don't know i mean i'm the most add person i've ever met i have the worst memory of anyone i have ever met unless it's 
I would a agree. medical study. Like I can quote medical studies and I think it's you know more of a connection, but I uh it would like go to dinner with someone with my girlfriend, she talked about them, I'm like, who are they? You know. Um, I mean, I'm scared to take one of the dementia tests, but I am better doing, you know, with, with peptides and like cerebral lysis and things like that. But um, yeah, it's always been bad. It's been a handicap because not remembering people, um, this is a big negative. And yeah. you've got over, it's like, oh, hi, do I know you? Or I, I went to Berkeley uh, oh, in high school, I went, uh, my parents moved and I went to high school for one day. I said, I'm not going. They're like, yes, you are. I'm like, no, I'm not. So I was pretty stubborn. And I said, no, I'm going back down to my old high school. And they go, well, we're not giving you money. I'm like, okay. And, uh, you know, I basically just, you know, live with families. And uh, and then we went to a reunion. I'm talking to this guy. I'm like, who are you? He's like, you live with me for a year. <laughs> you know. So uh, I can't recognize faces so well. And my mom had that problem too. So I'm mom is genetic and, and that, but um, I need like kind of the um, devil wears prod, like someone behind me, like this is so-and-so. Um, or we had our Christmas party and I'm talking about this guy, you know, one of the employees. It's so great. He helps me with research. And they're like, and I'm like, what? No, he's awesome. It was the wrong guy, you know? Um, and so, yeah. uh, I do a lot of generic, Hey, how you doing? You know, instead of, uh, so can, can you tell us a little bit about how your symptoms like progressed so that there was kind of a better understanding from you, from doctors or not understanding? I know that I know your story. So I know there's some pretty dramatic things that occurred. Can you help us understand? Yeah. So I was pretty good you know I was functioning I mean weird things that would happen to me like in college they called me the claw because my hand would stop working I couldn't hold a glass and but I wouldn't do anything about it because I knew they would go in and say there's nothing that you don't know um and then as I went into medical school especially residency I'm like something's really wrong here like everything was overwhelming um just anxiety, couldn't sleep, night sweats, got, you know, restless legs. Um, and I, you know, go to the university doctors like, oh, you're distressed, you know, take an antidepressant. I'm like, I'm not depressed. I can't function. And so I'm like, what am I going to do? And then for residency, I'm like, okay, what are my choices? Okay, wait, anesthesia, the patients are asleep. I don't have to talk to them, <laughs> you know? And, but I forgot the part about getting up early um so and then you know it was ingrained in medical school that anything alternative integrative means no evidence right and i'm was very evidence-based i'm very evidence-based now so that wasn't a consideration until i'm like i can't live like this i'm gonna you know uh and so i snuck off didn't tell anyone to you know so-called integrative uh conferences and i'm like wait a minute like, what a lie. These are more evidence-based than the stuff they're teaching me in residency, you know? And and so went on a program of like, you know, like my, my testosterone level was normal, but the lowest two and a half percent. My thyroid level, same thing. And high dose T3 was a savior for me. Um, some immune modulators and things like that, mitochondrial boosters. Uh, and... I'm like, oh my God, I'm a new person. Um, and I'm like, what am I doing in anesthesia? I hate it. And then went to, into family practice, took over a family practice that was all insurance, but we called it the thyroid optimization clinic and no advertising. It just took off and it was cash. Can we spend more time? We find, you know, and then from there, once you start treating things like that, you find so many other things and instead of doing the typical, you know, whatever HMO doctor and people like, oh, that's not my area, go over here. No, I'm gonna find, you know, read all the research and come back to that person and say, look, this is what I found, let's try this. And, and where were you in this 
process in terms of your health. Like you've optimized your thyroid, you're optimizing other people's thyroid. Yeah. But where are you in terms of your health? Are you okay. in a better place? And, or... and I was in Phoenix because um, I figured I got to have a backup to medicine. So we started a beer company and we actually had a hangover free beer. We had double blind with sebum control studies. And we put it out, and then the Bureau of Academic Tobacco Firearms says you can't make a healthy beer, you know. And uh, and then we made a energy beer before there were any energy beers, and people were like, "Why would I want that?" You know, now everyone understands. We had all the Cirques, Seven Elevens, uh, like the Hard Rock. We did a little uh, Super Bowl uh, Super Bowl party with little naughty nurses running around with Dr. Holty's little beer company, but we had a bad business plan. So when we tried to scale up, it was contract brewers. And plus, at that time, people wouldn't pay more than $5 a six-pack. You know, now it's like $17 for a four-pack. But, and it costs us seven to make. So we tried to make it up in volume, which didn't work. Uh, you know, and funnest industry ever. But I would see patients during the day and then go try to hawk beer at night, uh, which is humbling. But uh, we had no money either. So, but uh, so we ended up selling to rock bottom uh, for a rock bottom price, but uh, I wouldn't, I, it was like getting an MBA. Did you, I'm just curious, so you're, you're making me think of Four Locos because when I was a kid and I'm, you know, the biggest thing was to go out and drink Four Locos and you'd get, you know, the energy drink, you'd get the, the beer, right? The, and that was wildly popular, but it sounds like it was, uh, you were ahead of your time with, in your market there. Yeah, I think it was five years early. And plus I made it an IPA which I, that's what I like, but it killed it because people are like, ah, oh, ah, oh. you know, now it's like, you know, the biggest growing style, but we, yeah, we should. So you know. where are you in your health? I mean, you're burning the candle at both ends, which yeah. is top yeah. online patients. So therapy. was doing pretty well. And although I, it was more like a treatment for chronic fatigue syndrome, which I think is one of the worst things that they've ever done because, you know, you look at chronic fatigue syndrome, you have these symptoms, oh, you got chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh, we can't do anything about it. We're not going to do any, you know, test to see what it's from. Here's the antidepressant, get out of my office. Fibromyalgia, you know, press out 11 out of 18 tender points. And there's nothing special about those tender points either. It's like, how do you do a fibromyalgia? You got muscle pain? and you know brain fog and fatigue yes, okay you got it, it. I, you know and they have these rheumatology specialists like with a dolometer or whatever and they take some 40 minutes to do an exam for fibromyalgia and or people like you know, i remember richard say how do you know if they're better i'm like ask them <laughs> you know um but we become much more sophisticated with like labs that we can and our standard panel is about 40 tests to start with and we can generally tell if someone has chronic fatigue syndrome, Lyme, um, uh, and uh, basically how severe they are, probably 70 percentish accuracy. Yeah, but. So are you considering yourself at this point a chronic fatigue syndrome patient? How are you managing yourself as a patient? Um, I'm kind of a Sears patient now. And then. No, but I mean at this stage of your development. Oh. At, talking about then? Yeah. Yeah, I, I figured chronic fatigue syndrome because really Lyme was not even on the radar. And so it was chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. So like, you were really your own doctor? There was no other doctor working with you telling you what was going on? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, At what point did Lyme become something that you understood? Yeah, so what happened was then um, I went through a very stressful divorce. You know, when... I hired an attorney who says, oh, it doesn't have to be nasty. We'll make it mutual. She hires Gloria Allred for a, a consultant and fires her because they got in a fight. And then the woman on the cover of Power Woman a, a, a magazine, you know. And so it was a five-year um, divorce that with a crazy person. Um, and it was so, so, this is like stress. And we find that three things cause chronic illness in general. Maybe I'll put four in there. Um, stress is huge. And you'll see people 
death of a child, family member, could be an accident, another illness, often sets everything off. And it did a very big disservice to especially women who all of a sudden got chronic fatigue syndrome when they were stressed, or like I say, a divorce. So doctors, oh yeah, you're just a stressed out woman, you know, and just discounted it. But so toxins, which were more selective back then, now everyone just bombarded uh, with so many toxins and, you know, mold is, is a big thing. And I was gonna talk, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. I want to talk and, about then. And so then I was fine, but all of a sudden I just got so overwhelmed with this divorce that huge symptoms hit by a bus, bed bound, um, sweating, I couldn't sleep, terrible neuropathy. Um, I ended up going into heart failure. My heart was fibrosed, which I now know is from high human transfer growth factor beta, uh, which is a big problem. Uh, and I couldn't stand up. I couldn't, it would take me hours to walk up the stairs. I mean, I could not function. Everything was overwhelming to me. Answering a phone, like, what are these people calling like at three in the afternoon? What's wrong with them, you know? And uh, and then, so with the heart failure, I went to the um, cardiologist and he did an echo. He goes, you got a lot of like your heart fibrosed. It wouldn't fill enough. And he goes, maybe in 10 years, you get 10% better. So I'm like, I'm not going to live like this. I, I will, you know, I plan my suicide on Halloween for some reason, but... And then so I said, well, I'm either going to do it or let me try to fix it. So I kind of went around the world at one mile an hour, um, you know, bent over, running through, the, you know, not running, but moving through the airport. I remember um, uh, and just going to different doctors, doing weird stuff, did a lot of weird treatments. A lot of things work, you know. So like one of, what are some of the treatments that you did? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, plasmapheresis, which is obviously awesome, you know, ozone. Um, we uh, uh, basically did um, the apheresis and we took out the natural killer cells. And then I, I called this guy. So I, I, I read a study on with Lyme that the dendritic cells are screwed up. And those are the, the cells are the most plentiful white cells are very small and they recognize the you know foreign thing and they bring them back to the other white cells to tell them hey let's go kill this thing and they're totally dysfunctional in cancer I read that article I'm like that's interesting and the same day in a different journal I happen to read the same thing goes on with Lyme so I said this is what I need and so I called all like the cancer centers of America and places and I'm, I'm like can you do this I'll bring you Lyme antigens and you say like uh let me think about it no <laughs> you know and so but I found a um, guy I knew through ILADS from the Lyme organization and he did like oh, uh, yeah Omar Morales at Lyme, Lyme Mexico Lyme Mexico and uh I said hey uh you're doing natural killer cell function and apheresis what if you take out my natural killer cells? I'll bring you Lyme antigens. Let's stimulate it and put it back. And he goes, I haven't done it before, but yeah, let's do it. Um, and so we did it and I felt great, you know? And then, but uh, we tried to freeze it and then bring it back for treatment. And we it told it, told yeah. it, we just, it was just mush. Um I remember, so I, Kent and I met um, six years ago. Oh. How long have we known each other? Seven years ago? Anyway, quite I a long time, time ago. Always like three months? Yeah. And um, we met through a patient because I brought a patient to work with you and we worked. And so that's sort of hard. But at the time that um, I met Kent, he was very much in the throes of his own treatment. Um, oh, just sweating and just, he yeah. had turned blue like blue um and you called yourself a smurf at the time well I didn't notice it no one told me I was doing I was doing high, high dose argyria 
no, not Algeria, um, uh, Argentin, which I wrote a paper saying you can't get Algeria. And another one of the doctors in the office convinced me to do Gary Gordon's like silver. And within a week, I'm just blue. He was blue. And, Gray. Blue. And, and then I took Dapsone and got methoglobinemia. And uh, and then I was just purple. Yeah. I mean, he was where it was worrisome. You know, we we were all who knew him and who worked with him and who, you know, we would worry about him because and that was before you went to Elmar, before you did all that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I was basically saying, OK, um, that hey, there's like the Horowitz style who's awesome, uh, contributed so much to new treatments and he's more multi-system now, but just you need higher, higher antibiotics, right? And so I was doing like seven, eight antibiotics at three times a dose, five times a dose. I would never give that to a patient, but I'm like, I'm going to kill this thing that's going to kill me. And um, uh, and then I ended up in in the hospital with sepsis. And, and I remember one of the nurses on the change, I could hear her, she goes, Oh, this is that AIDS patient who keeps turning up negative for HIV, like man, you know. And uh, uh, and then what? After I started, you know, kind of getting into the treatment and multi system, I found out my natural killer cell function, which is the cell that that basically kills intracellular infections, cancer, it was zero. So it wouldn't matter how much because antibiotics don't kill everything; they knock it down. A certain point so the immune system can take over and we find that is probably the best marker for uh, downstream th1 activity um and then so what we've learned Ed, is that you know, your body has uh in a gross oversimplification but you have to because it's the immune system it is like th1 t reg th2 th17 and so the Th1 gets stuff inside the cell, Th2 gets stuff outside the cell, Th17 is like the autoimmune antibody. And like when you get Lyme, it immediately secretes cytokines to suppress Th1, then it goes in the cell, usually within 48 hours. So this whole, oh, it has to be connected, you know, and then it suppresses that Th1, then it goes intracellular, now you got chronic Lyme. And also with just aging, and you kind of look at chronic Lyme, chronic disease as, as accelerated aging. I mean, there's all the same components. Right. Um, and uh, so with, with no T, TH1, that it doesn't matter. You're not going to be able, and also you have all this inflammation because it's like a teeter-totter. And so the body's trying to compensate and you just feel terrible. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of became, we were a kind of, hormone optimization and thyroid. Then we're the big antibiotic people. Now we're, I would say, we do a lot of things. We still do all those things, but an immune modulatory clinic. Right. And, and we've gotten patients so much better. They often don't need antibiotics or instead of the five years, three years and feeling horrible, oh, great, it means it's working, that maybe three months, um, four months. And I'll tell you my recent relapse and right so no, we don't do it right now but. no no so 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 essentially you're saying that um you went through you know doing all of these heavy duty antibiotics that was like a big that was sort of the beginning i met you during that time you were doing a lot of killing then you you tried to work through doing um more kind of immune enhancement with Omar and Omar has a lot of very, you know, interesting tricks that way. Um, did you feel at that stage, did you feel that, okay, now I'm cured now I'm not a Lyme no. patient anymore. Okay. So I, I had good days. I make it to the office, but just feeling horrible and then sweating. And I did a media tour. It was like, you know, Fox news, good morning, America. Um, you know, uh, CBS, you know, all, all those shows. And it was just like, I had to spray this stuff on my hair the night before to keep from sweating. And this is like all aluminum. It's just like, you burn, ah! And I'm like, oh my God, that, how much aluminum did I get from that? But, um, 
you know, it's a struggle. I mean, mm -hmm. life's hard as it is, but then mm -hmm. when you add Lyme or specific babesia that, you know, patients, patients with Lyme will tell someone, oh, how bad it is. They don't know. And I found that people tend to lose empathy about two to three weeks. Okay, they'll give it to you, you know, but then after a while, it's like, come on here, go exercise, you know, here, eat the, the better, you know, and you're like, I want to kill you. And even my, you know, wife was starting to do that. And I'm like, if you keep this up, we're, I can't, you know, I, I can't be with you just saying that, oh, just get out. Like, please don't say that one more time. You know? Right. Um, because you just, you, it just, you feel so bad to the bone, you know? Yeah. And then I had, you know, neuropathy, restless legs where I couldn't stand up. I couldn't sit down. I would just take like 20 showers a night trying to get some relief. Um, just the anxiety, you can't, it, you can't tolerate any stress. Um, you know, the brain fog, the muscle aches, the... I mean, it's just so multi-system. So when you went past, you know, doing the work with Omar, what was the pivot for you after that, where you're like, okay, so this worked to some extent, I have had some gains, maybe not so many gains. Yeah. What was the next step for yeah. you? Yeah, a lot of treatments that didn't do anything, and some of them are good treatments, like for a number of people, but... You know, nothing works for everyone. And, um, but so I went to Europe. I was just traveling around, just trying to find unique therapies. And I was in Belgium and I found uh, some peptides and I took them and I really didn't expect anything. And then like three days later, I just, I just walked up the damn stairs upright. Wait a minute, what did I do? And so kind of went back and said, oh my gosh, these peptides started taking that. I'm like, I'm feeling good. And, but at that time we couldn't get them into the US, but shortly after that, um, we, we were able to. So we kind of became, a, you know, known for peptides, but, but we do so many things like, you know, from PTSD, neurodegenerative diseases, hypothyroidism, you know, hormone optimization. But um, we're we're kind of known for that um, because we put out originally put out a line of injectable peptides, but the regulations were just crazy cross state that uh, we didn't want to risk that. But now we have a line of um, integrated peptides, which are uh, supplements, and uh, and so. So did you feel that peptides were kind of a cure and a solve for you? Was that the solve for you? It was. It changed my life. It, it saved my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was like a big, that was the big step forward. For you yeah, I'm not that. saying I wasn't doing anything else, mm -hmm. you know, and immune activation of coagulation. My blood was so thick, you could not take it out with like a 14 gauge like trocar. I had to like try to stand on the desk to just get a CC out. And so really learned about about the science behind that. And you look at so many people are hypercoagulable. Then you add, you know, the vaccine to that and COVID. Um, it's it's a huge problem. And then you know, recently with the uh, thing. So, you know, curing that was great. I figured I'm gonna drop dead of a heart attack or a stroke here anytime. But um and most doctors will put people on like Eliquis or, or these things. In fact, uh, the other doctor in office has, a, he had a totally occluded femoral artery and they gave him four stents. They all caught it off like cement. Wow. And, and they told him that, well, Eliquis is better than heparin or Lovenox. Um, and I'm like, no, it's not. And he said, it's interesting because I said a a patient who he put on Eliquis because all the research supposedly that they do says, oh, it's safer, it's better. And he said, put her on it and she just felt horrible. And obviously that didn't work for him. 
And uh, we found it an interesting on um, like the, uh, like a lot of Lyme chat groups, mast cell chat groups, that they're, especially the mast cell guys, are so smart, so nerdy, and I mean that in a good way, but they're so in the biochemistry, they miss the clinical picture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying, I'm doing, you know, heparin for POTS, and they're like, no way, heparin is going to make it worse. I'm like, and then you kind of start, well, let me call the patients. I'm like, let's switch you to Lovenox at least. They're like, no, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and heparin also is very antimicrobial and immune modulator. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen it stimulate mass cell. Yeah, yeah, no, you've used, but you've used um, heparin with a lot of our mutual um, patients. Um, so um, now I just want to talk a little bit about this last, you know, eight, nine months of your treatment because I've been very much on board with it so I can, you know, contribute. Um, for many years, you know, as I was coming and working with you and seeing patients and stuff, you'd always say, I, I need to talk to you about my teeth, Daisy. I need to talk to you about my teeth. Oh, yes. And I was like, yeah, well, I need to get a panoramic x-ray, you know, and this, and is, this was after eight dentists, periodontists, oral surgeons, biologic dentists said nothing going on there. I'm like, I got swollen glands. I got, I you know, I could just feel it. And then, uh, so I'll let you tell well, you. the other thing is that Kent has been on camera a, a lot. He's on camera a lot for peptide conferences and um, all kinds of interviews and all sorts of things. As you know, as as a doctor who's well known in the community, and unfortunately, poor Kent, his teeth were kind of falling apart, breaking apart, and he had been gluing them back together oh, himself. Yeah. So super glue. I went. I went. How it all started was I went to a dentist referred by a patient who I thought as a recommendation, but she was getting paid, you know? Okay. And uh, and so I go in and I just want to get some veneers. And, but he's just grinding, grinding, grinding. I'm like, like, do you say anything? something? Do you say something? Like, I don't want to be rude. Um, and then, so he like leaves for a second. I pull my phone. I'm like, what the hell? He ground all my teeth down and did a whole, whole, Brown and they came out over a hundred times. And I remember I was walking up to lecture at A4M and my two front teeth fell out. Um, and it's just been a disaster. And Oran, I did the um, Peptide Summit where I interviewed like 50 doctors. And during the interview, my teeth fell out, you know. And but I said, let's roll. And we got so many great responses, like. If he leaves that on, he's got to be telling the truth, like, you know. It's like, I had heart failure, I have no teeth. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so after like multiple times, you know, I just said, Kent, you know, you've got to give me a panoramic x-ray, like I've got to have it bedded, da, da, da. So, you know, I don't know, this is like a two, three year process. We keep talking about this. Yeah, I'm not good at it. very bad at follow through. And I'm, I'm like, I'm good as I say, not as I do. I go say. to this office and they're going to do a panoramic x-ray and they're going to send it to me. Okay. And let's, you know, let me see, let me vet it. Let me, so I send it to Switzerland and it comes back and it's like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, Kent, we have to go to Europe together. And so. That was when our relationship kind of became a little bit more formal as me being your health advocate and um, you being my client. Yes, I would have blown it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he would have blown it up. But so, um, but I, well, in my role, you know, it's kind of hard to blow me off because I make all the goals <laughs> and set all the goals. That's for sure. And, you know, so <laughs> kind of like the protocol police. And so, so anyway, so. So we went to Europe and we, we've been now twice um, and we all got COVID. <laughs> it was very fun. I'm still mad because she goes, you got COVID. I go, no, it's not COVID. No, no, no. He says to me, post-op, something's wrong with me, Daisy. I need to take a lot of antibiotics. You know, like, could you get me some more? Like this one and this one and that one. And I look at him, he's like, I have a fever. And I'm like, Kent. I don't think you have an infection in your mouth. Like, no. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I think you have COVID. I'm like, oh, no. I don't have COVID. 
And then we do the test, and I'm like, damn it, false positive. <laughs> so he had COVID. Um, but anyway, so Kent had this amazingly um, self-orchestrated dental plan. <laughs> He had green glue. He had like, you know, a, a like oh, a yeah, very I strange would... bone graft that had like no, it had like a like a staple and like some weird metal in it. Um, I mean, we can, we we have this dream to um, make him and myself a case study through, you know, a, a, yeah, and I because we I both think... have like the worst dental cases, and so you know we're we doing that documentary um i don't know if you would talk, would talk about that but no. um and uh, uh what the hell was i getting at your um, teeth the case yeah study. that oh I, I just i think teeth are such an important part i you know i'm, I'm like oh teeth whatever blah 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 uh it's huge and so many people you know they have their wisdom teeth pulled they don't they don't suture it they don't or get root canals and it doesn't get all the bacteria out and just festers in there. And I learned, I thought, oh, you get an x-ray, you know. No, it doesn't, it doesn't show or they don't look close enough. But when we looked at the x-rays that they looked at, when you looked at it, you're like, well, wait a minute, what's this here? What's this here? But One of the amazing things about working with Swift Biohealth Clinic for me um, as a patient advocate and as a patient as well, but as a patient advocate is that they is so much you know um collaboration i'm in the surgery and i was in the they surgery listen to and they, they do listen to me and you know we can look at things that it might be kind of in the balance and really kind of weigh them and use applied kinesiology to understand and so we did a really really thorough job and 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 it was an amazing journey it was amazing for you but it also provided some um you know there was unfortunately dental work can kind of uh bring forth some latent symptoms, you know, some latent symptomology and some, I some felt great after nine hour surgery. Yes. And it's true. There's very little pain, Just but then out butter out of my jaw. But then there was a period where you had a little bit of a tough time, you know, after that in the interim. Um, yeah. Well, I think we know why. Now. Um, because he went home to a mold. Well, I think that set it off. So we were building a home and it's so far behind. So we sold our other house, good timing, we thought, um, and been living in hotels and Airbnbs, but they don't like, allow you to do long term. So we had a suitcase and just resting the heck out of me. Um, but uh, uh, so we went back the second time and and the other I'm like I'm not feeling well and uh and then so she goes we got to go get this inosphoresis and I love plasmapheresis but plasmapheresis they basically separate out your blood from your plasma and they dump your plasma so they got to give you back albumin, albumin which now you know, it seems to be, you know, cleaned a little better than blood, but our blood supply is totally contaminated. So you, you know, clean the blood protein. and then you give a dirty person's albumin back to the clean blooded person. Yeah. And in America, this is how it's done. And, and with this machine, it actually takes your uh, plasma, puts it through, you know, specialized filters and gives it back to you. And the stuff that came out, was he's like well first i go there and he does a live cell analysis and he's been doing this for a long time he's actually retired came back and he stands up and like his clipboard drops he goes this is the worst blood i've seen in 43 years i'm like huh? i call him dracula because he takes everybody's blood and cleans it. and i'm like I'm Doctor, hold on. That, you know give and, us give us some more information on that what, what how bad was your blood right? What was in it? Was it was was he seeing other bacteria, viruses? No, you know, give us a little more meat on that bone. Look at that, and actually well, sending he, it. He had severe Rouleau syndrome, where it was every cell was completely clumped together. There were no white blood cells. We couldn't see yeah, any no, white no. blood cells. And um, we, do we have the befores? We just have the afters. Yeah, that's like that was and, in between. And 
he basically looked like there was is it was completely asphyxiated like there was absolutely no i don't see how it was flowing there was yeah and it wasn't by the way one of the reasons because swiss biohealth clinic does have an innis pharesis machine but they wouldn't do it because they had to do a groin catheter and um because kent's veins and even during his second surgery we couldn't and so when you when you do um dental jawbone surgery um, at, at Swiss Biohealth Clinic, they use, um, they draw a good amount of blood so that they can make this protein rich growth factor, which then they put into your bone as a stem cell, your own. And it looks like worms essentially. And, you know, his, his, um, we call them membranes. His membranes were so poor, we could almost not use them. We had to draw his blood you know, three that's, different that's times. Very, that's very hurtful. I'm sorry, you had shitty membranes. <laughs> and so, and so essentially, you know, when he was asleep, we were like, this is not like a sign of optimal oh, health. You're, you're talking you're crap talking about, about sleep. Your <laughs> So, I mean, when he came to, I was like, you know, Ken, I'm concerned about the quality of your blood. Like I want to take you to do an aspirasis. So we've yeah, had a lot of people. Um, a lot. To Alpstein and, and yeah. And so, and Dracula was like, I've seen a lot of funny yeah, guys, so, but you're the funniest. So yeah. And then, <laughs> and then he says, oh, you gotta, you know, take it easy. Da, da, da. And then I'm on my phone making all these calls. He goes, I'm glad to see that you're following my recommendation. Yeah, he's like, you've got and to stop I didn't get the sarcasm. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, but yeah, here's the before. So you That's can my see damn like the blood. blood, like cells, just not, there's no wow. separation of cells. They're like completely. I don't know. It's like, Dr. Holdup, if you're comfortable, can you can you please email us those photos so we can attach yeah. them to the show yeah, notes yeah. because our, our listeners like, can't see the the video. It's, it's all like cauliflower, macaroni, and cheese. Yeah, it's all then, it's all just glob together. That's actually the medical it's thing. Yeah, and then after two anaspheresis and with a very interesting inter inter what was that? What we call intermission. Because one, because Kent, and I can say this lovingly, Kent is not light handed when it comes to his own care. Oh, I, it, I do toxicity studies in myself. In fact, last night I took, I had taken Gapsone before. And so I told my girlfriend, and I just happened to have, you know, I got methylobinemia turned blue uh, and happened to have IV meth, um, uh, methylene blue in you know my house so i just ran it but so i told her okay i'm gonna do this pill can you keep these in case i'm dying she's like i gotta go to bed and i'm like well i'm glad your priorities are they're right she's used to him. <laughs> and she goes get a bell i might like, be able to speak so so the first trip his girlfriend lori was this just wonderful wonderful person who understands this journey herself um came with us and so, and when we're flying there, she's like, tell me about this clinic. Tell me where we're going, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, oh, I don't know. See, I normally I'd research it, but when Daisy, I mean, Daisy's been to every expert in every country and she's been there and then she in, integrates that, you know, to her knowledge and her care. So I, I don't trust any doctor generally. But I trust you, you know. So you know, his girlfriend's like, "How do you not have you not researched this? You know, like we're, this is where we're going." You so know, like, yeah. second trip, she's like, "Well, honestly, Daisy, I don't think I need to go. You got this." And I'm like, "Yeah, you're right. I got this." So the second day, we're supposed to go to Innisfarisis. Um, I get you know we're at the hotel, and I think I was on a different floor than you. But anyway, we get a I get a text from Kent yeah, saying, got the nice place. I'm not." I'm not doing very well. I think, you know, I think you need to come see me. So I don't know. So, you know, the clinic lets me have a, like a oh, catheter, have a and, line inpatient so that I can and, manage their and pain. And don't even bring her in for the aesthetic part and say, what do you think? And I remember, you know, I was like, oh, it's fine. And she said, no, 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 you got to, 
you know, save this part down. I mean, my job is to make sure that things are thorough and there's nothing, there's no stone left unturned, including the aesthetic of something. So, but anyway, so Ken just like, I don't know what I did. I gave myself a bunch of this and this and that and this and this and that. And he's like shivering and vomiting and he's got a fever. And I'm like, so, uh, <laughs> maybe you have COVID. <laughs> so long story short, it, we don't know. He, we, we don't know what he it. did to himself, but. Um, yeah, but when you look at this, it explains it. But so after two treatments, like full of white cells, yeah, like you can see wide the open, red you know, cells. separation of um, of of, of, the, of like the red here. cell. Um, that is but, that is a wild transformation. We really need to get those photos when you put them in the show notes yeah. because yeah, yeah, we need, yeah. we need people them, to see how yeah, powerful I, that I is. I have it in front of the Dropbox, so I'll afford that to you. But, um, but the you, scary thing is, I'm looking through it and I'm like, what the hell is that? There's a giant parasites all through in the red blood cells. Right, you, you can see it. I mean, you can't see. Yeah, it's, I don't oh know. wow, yes. You know, I mean, a but, ton. Usually, you gotta like search and search and search, but um, you know, this like, is the like big thing sitting there. I'm yeah. like, oh my god, so, it looks like Babesia to me, but we keep coming up negative. But. So we. This, so those are know, parasites inside the cells. That's what we're seeing, right? Cell. Yeah. Wow. So this leads us to you know now we're kind of in this place where we're doing a deeper dive on on Ken's health because we learned a lot in the last yeah and months. and it kind of happened when and I got busy I stopped doing all my treatments stopped doing you know just basic maintenance stuff and uh stopped doing peptides that I would do you know at least three times a week um and then you start feeling bad so then you really don't do treatments it's harder and then it just hit me i'm just like i'm not feeling well and this i'm surprised i was able to well you know, actually you know i remember in and you can comment on this but when you came back you went you had some very tough days you had some anxiety um you had some really severe anxiety so you were pushed back into some old symptomology um and you you know you've really been working through it so it's been kind of a little bit of a relapse for you yeah no it, it has and so i i was in denial for like a few months mm -hmm. and then i'm like i think it's come back you know and i, I don't even think you ever get rid of it. i think you suppress it you know kind of like epstein Barr and you know and the herpes viruses and i stopped doing what i uh, should be doing and, and but, then the other bad habit that Ken has is that he stays up all night long and works and works and works and works and works and works we for two days, two days, you know, and, um, and so, you what, know, and when we, and, and so part of my role with him as an advocate is like, look, Ken, you I'm know, so behind. I get that you have this much to do. And I get that, you know, you have to make an impact, especially now we need all to make a bigger impact with what's going on in the world. And I said, but you, you're not going to save time by using all the time like you're gonna die you know and so i've been kind of an intervention in his survival system and you know reminding yeah, him that he's a, human and that he nice has person, to be a human, human being i don't know i guess i'm very geeky and like i'll start getting into research which then needs more research and go down the rabbit hole and all of a sudden the light you know the sun's coming up you know yeah and, and it's understandable and he, because you're very passionate and that i guess leads me to you know, look, you always wanted to be a doctor, you know, you didn't necessarily want to be a doctor for the reasons that you are a doctor today. So it's interesting well, it, to it, me. That was more of a joke. No, but, yeah. no, but it is interesting because the progression of yourself as a human being in your career in relationship to your own health journey, like how did that transform for you in terms of your contribution and in terms of who you are today? Oh, because well, I, would, I think if I, and this is what I was in the back of my mind, I was like, I can't stand living like this, but I had this glimmer of hope that if I, this is going to help me at some point. And I would have been treating Lyme patients. I would have just kind of, oh yeah, they're just, you know, not so and stuff. I could have been very much the doctors that we hate, 
you know? Well, you refer Th to yourself. Thank God you're not, though, is what I have to say, because I yeah. just want to I just want to chime in. You you both are being so humble right now. Dr. Holtoff, we've heard about you since we started Tick Boot Camp. In fact, one of our favorite people, Danny Tiger, has had radical transformations and is feeling so much better after treating at, you know, at the Holtorf Medical Center. So, I mean, thank God, unfortunately, you had to go through this horrible journey, but now you're helping people get their lives back through your clinic. And it's really cool to see Daisy, who is one of our, our favorite guests we've ever had on the podcast and one of our most popular guests we've ever had on the podcast, be there to help you along in this journey as well. I mean, the two of you are such powerhouse individuals. And I think people are going to really love hearing this, this combination of you two together to keep you and your health in check, Dr. Holtoff, and keep people like Danny Tiger and others in the podcast in a proper path to healing and, and health. So I just wanted to inter interject and, and oh, thank you both for everything you've done. Awesome. She spoiled me. I don't want to see a patient without her. And like she'll finish my sentences. And I think we should give, what do you think of this? Like, yes, that's what I was going to say, you know. So she's she's really great, knowledgeable, um, and able to, it's hard to keep me on track and, uh, and you know, do all the little things like, you know, actually let people know what they're supposed to be taking, you know, uh, things like that. You guys but, and I have worked really well together because yeah. I can write protocols from his methodology. I understand. I mean, I, I have, as a, an advocate, I've been able to do that with a handful of doctors and and I have to say, I feel very fortunate that the doctors that I do work with, like Kent, really do trust me, really do know that I medically, I'm very savvy so that I can, you know, support their vision. And so that's been wonderful, but it's also really been wonderful to be part of, of Kent's recovery journey for him, because he needs to be optimized in order for for him to be able to do what he needs yeah, to do. Yeah, because I I yeah. push it. I I'm you know, as soon as so I started treatment like seven days ago. I'm already feeling so much better. And what do I do? Also, I stay up for two days. He he you know? he doesn't know you know how not to be bankrupt in his own energy system, and it's habitual. And he's been doing that his whole life. So yeah. part of the rehabilitation for a patient like this is to teach them that they actually have to have a savings account of energy and um, to manage that. And, and then there's a haphazard, haphazard, there's a haphazard quality to Kent's way of managing his own care because he knows everything. You know, Kent and I both as patients, we have tried everything. You know, there isn't anything we haven't tried ourselves that we haven't, like if we're gonna help people with antisenescence therapy, then we're gonna, you know, go through antisenescent therapy. And so ultimately, you know, he could have a table full of a ton of crap and wake up in the morning and just like, I'm gonna take this, 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 and that, and then say, you're feeling good today, what did you do? I don't know, you know, and unfortunately, so many Lyme patients do this where they, you know, they've seen 10 doctors in the last 10 months, and they have protocol one through 10 on the counter, and they haven't even bought stuff on protocol 11, because they don't know what it is, and they haven't researched it, and then they don't have, there's no method to any of it, and then you know, there's a lack of rigor, there's a lack of consistency, and there's a lack of methodology. And even for someone who knows, because he's a doctor, you know, on the front lines taking care of people, it's easy to let go of, of all of that. Yeah, stuff. but it's also, you can see pain when you feel bad, and also when you feel good, I can take advantage of that, you know? And yeah, so when you stay up as long as I can, and, you know, it hurts you in the, in the long run. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I tell people exercise, eat well, like I'm, I'm passionate about exercise. I exercise every four months for eight minutes, rain or shine. So <laughs> I don't want to overtrain. I've seen people overtrain. I'm protecting against that. So I know there's some like special questions that we ask, or maybe there's more things that you guys yeah, didn't ask for. I just want to mention one thing. I with the with the heart thing because that was the thing I could not tolerate. <laughs> and uh, and then so you know the cardiologist said maybe in ten years you get ten percent better with rigorous cardiac rehab. I'm like, no, I'm not. That's not enough. 
And so I do all these peptides and treatments and within feel better in six months. And then in about a year, just over a year, I walk in the office upright and get an echo. And he's like, that's weird. I didn't think the fibrosis could reverse. Did he even ask me what I did? No, he didn't care. Um, and I'm like, okay, thank you. You know, um, but Do you think you signed a release to say that you, you know, spontaneously healed and you can oh, yeah. someone and they said, Well, I don't I don't believe in that. So you think it's a miracle, it said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this is this is where I think it's so important, and we always express to people. You have that hope, right? Because certain doctors may say you're going to be sick forever. You're never going to feel better. But I think we need to continue to have hope because there is something out there that can help us. And the more hope we have and the more things we continue to do, the better we're going to feel. And overall, we're going to make gains in our health, right? And I just don't want to lose sight of, I mean, we are so appreciative, Dr. Holtor, for all you do for the community. And, and we want to thank you for sharing your story because it is really powerful, everything you've gone through and overcome in your journey. And now with the help of Daisy, but I do, Rich is gonna jump in after, after I finish his question, but I really wanna focus on your, your clinic and how you're helping people as well at the end of this interview, because I mean, you really are changing lives and saving lives through the Holtorf Medical Clinic. And you're doing some really cool, powerful stuff and research with, with all kinds of different things. You talked about peptides, uh, the endocrine system, hormones, et cetera. So if you could just quickly touch on that and how you're helping people now in the chronic illness community and the Lyme community. Yeah, and you know, we started um, some, you know, FDA trials uh, as well to try to get this more mainstream. But it really found that medicine moves very slow. And uh, we actually have an article on our, our nonprofit, National Academy of Hypothyroidism, any hypothyroidism.org, but someone hacked all our sites, but we're fixing those. But it says, people would say, if this is so great, why doesn't my doctor know about it? And so it goes through and it was even like LA Times and the papers, like doctors, you know, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine showed that most doctors are practicing 20 years behind what's available in medical research. Now, okay, yeah, they don't read medical research. They may read an abstract that a, that a drug rep brings in, but they found the biggest reason for it taking, so it takes on average 17 years for a proven new therapy to get accepted to mainstream medicine. And again, it takes 17 years unless there's a, uh, it's a, it's a drug and has a sales force. And, and they found the biggest resistance was if you give a doctor, here's 50 studies showing what you're doing isn't optimal, there's a better way to do it. They discount it. They go, oh, my patients are different. I don't like that study. Um, and, but also, so I used to get very mad at the doctors but they're in a system that doesn't allow them to do anything. Like for them, a Lyme patient is a nightmare because they got to keep a quota. They, uh, you know, they're you know, bogging down their system. They're just getting frustrated. You know, I think they said a doctor will interrupt the patient like, hey, how are you feeling within 10 seconds? Um, but, you know, they're graded on how cost effective. And what does that mean? It means, don't do any labs, don't make diagnoses, see, you know, patient every 15 minutes. Um, and so they're in a system that like, if they see any complex illness, they're going to turf them. And so you're going to get, oh, you're going to go to a neurologist or you can go to a, uh, you know, cardiologist, a gastroenterologist, you're going to go, you know, to all these different groups, but they're not going to put anything. They're going to do their little thing that they do. They're gonna yes, do a colonoscopy and a scope and go, oh, you're fine. They're, you know, and uh, and you're just, you, you can't, they don't put it together and it's all connected. Art of referral. So Dr. Holtoff, there's, there's, I think there's two different lines that we should probably explore here together just to give folks some um, insight into how to best work with their primary physician, right? Because most folks who are um, who are going to be dealing with Lyme disease are going to have to get the most out of the current medical system, and they're going to have to know how to work with a primary care physician. So what recommendations would you have for folks that would allow them to get the best outcome when they're working with someone 
who is working with an insurance system and only have 15 minutes to diagnose and treat the patient? It's essentially an impossible task. Yeah. Um, I like, I tell people to stick with their doctor, if they'll work with other doctors, um, but you can ask more time, they're usually not interested. But if a doctor says, I don't know, stick with them. Mm -hmm. And we found the, the less a doctor knows, usually the more adamant they're right. Um, and so unfortunately, this whole insurance model mm -hmm. and it's so bureaucratic and you know so much money goes or you look at labs like to, to go to uh, quest or lab core if a patient has insurance they don't cover it they'll charge them 171 dollars for a tsh now if they go through our office and we bill it we we don't charge up you know, um, any labs it's 19 dollars but I can get it now, I found out, for 75 cents. Mm. So how much do you think they're paying for that test that they're charging 175 for? Uh, probably a nickel, you know? But I think it's also really important for people to educate themselves. Like, for example, my father-in-law who lives in Glen Cove, right? He has a lot of, I mean, he probably has Lyme disease. I've talked to him about this multiple times and here his, you know, daughter-in-law is Lyme advocate. And, um, and yet, you know, they, somebody did a Western blot on him. Obviously it was inconclusive. Um, but like one of the, one of the things that's disturbing, he's diabetic, he's had all kinds of issues. It's like, he has elevated T. He's an elevated TSH. Nobody's done a, nobody's done any further thyroid studies on this person who has metabolic disorder. <laughs> like, you know, that's it's, it's crazy. Like, if a primary care sees a, a TSH <laughs> at ten, they send him to endocrinologist. Like, just treat it. You know. Yeah, or we're talking about like a TSH of like five point five. They say that it's normal. It's you know what I mean? Crazy. So like, and they're the pituitary sees the most thyroid. If it wants more thyroid, you're not getting any. And I, I really have a big issue with pediatricians. And you look at obese children, they'll have a high TSH. But they go, oh, if you lose the weight, that will come down. And it does, you know, part with the inflammation. But the kid's not going to lose weight with a low thyroid. And what's the chance of a obese kid going to be an obese adult uh, and then you got self-esteem issues and you know other problems. It's, these, it's criminal. These are the things that I think patients can educate themselves about. You know, they don't necessarily need to go outside the box, and you know, they can it, they can request. You can request a complete thyroid panel. End of story, you know, and and inform yourselves about just conventional labs within the the system. What is it that's not being done? Ask for all of your results. Take them home. Study them. You know, understand what yeah, it is that you're getting and that you're a, not getting. It's a daunting task. It's a daunting though. task, but it's doable. And many people out there are smart and, and they don't have the education. You know, and, one of my... And the doctor will just intimidate them. And, and they stop being Dr. Yeah, Google. Don't ask questions. But, you know, one of my passions is to educate the world at large and you know, the community at large, not just Lyme patients, because Lyme pa patients are more, more, more savvy, typically way more savvy than the average patient. But nowadays, everybody needs to be educated. We need to learn what we don't know so that we can be part of our own solution, so that we can be part of a greater solution. Uh, it's totally true. But most people, it's too overwhelming. And like, you know, when I go to parties now, I have to bring lab slips because everyone's like, <laughs> And so many people are sick. It's like, I'm sick, my you know, sister's sick, my wife, and they're asking all these questions. And then they're like, well, my doctor says I don't have that. Well, how's that working for you? You know, and I used to fill out a lab slip there, but I found the majority never followed through. So I don't, don't do that anymore. Yeah. 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 So, Dr. Holtoff, don't we really just have an acute care system at this point? As we move toward a managed care system, and I can tell you that I'm old enough to have been, you know, a patient under under the pre-managed care system, the pre, you know, Bill Clinton uh, presidential administration, 
And the quality of care that I had received during the early part of my life was substantially different than the quality of care I've received since then. And I think that's because we made a policy decision, or at least elected officials made a policy decision, that what we were going to do is we were going to open up the system to a larger number of people, and we were going to turn the system into an acute care system, not a chronic care system. And as a result, the only way that you can truly get the care that you need if you have a chronic disease is to either follow the model that Daisy was just advocating for, which is to become an educated um, uh, patient, or to step out of the system and work with people who are not working within the traditional system. If you don't take one approach or the other, I think you're right. It is impossible. You're not going to get better because this is purely an acute care system. Give me your reaction to that. Yeah, um, I think it's changing, but in general, people didn't want to spend, they don't think they should spend money on healthcare. Um, and, you know, I have insurance and I get it. You have insurance, but what does it get you? Um, and unless it's cosmetic, but, you know, I, I did, I was really into healthcare reform and put together um, you know, whole healthcare reform thing, did a lot of interviews and US News and World Report accepted it for publication, but then but uh, edited it and everything and then pulled it the last 10 minutes. Oh. But and then I was trying to get a letter to someone in Congress or something, I ended up getting to Paul Ryan, and they they have me sign a thing that I won't quote him. And then he sends me back a letter. Well, I read your proposal, and it's very interesting. Um, but it would never happen because do you know how many people are slurping off the trough of healthcare? You know. Well, you know, th so the so the argument that we've heard from some of the folks in our community is that we need to move closer to a um, to a to a, um, a a system like the British system or the Israeli system or you know some of these other systems. And yeah. what we what we or the Canadian system what we found is when we've interviewed people from Israel and we've interviewed people from the UK and we've interviewed people from Canada and Australia, that the system is actually worse, that it that it that that the the people who have Lyme disease who are in some of these, you know, these government run programs have to step out of the system even more quickly than we have to in the US because because the the managed care that's available in in those public systems is even worse than what we have here. And the only way that you're going to get treatment is stepping out of the system. So it's not to move further towards, um, you know, these government run programs, but it's actually to yeah, become either a more- If you break a leg or something simple, but if you have complex illness, forget it. But it's interesting how we think we're the free market, um, uh, you know, system and things like people like Sweden, are socialist. It's actually the opposite. We are the least free market. How? I, tell me how you can negotiate a price of your men. How you can negotiate the price of your care. These like uh, Sweden, they offer universal care, but you have copays. You have all these decisions. You're involved with. Hey, I want this drug. You can get it, but you have to pay. You know more. Um, and we have no such incentives anymore. Like my brother's on Medi-Cal. Uh, he, I go and picked up some of his meds and I had like trazodone and it was taken for sleep for a while. Uh, like mine was like $47. His was zero, 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 you know? And, uh, and he takes the ambulance as an Uber. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, I because I grew up, I grew up in a in a country actually that is, I think, successful, the most successful when it comes to socialized or, you know, nationalized health, which is France, um, because, but not for the types of illnesses that we're talking about. Chronic illnesses. So right? my sister, you know, uh, they have more free market system inside of that. Correct. They do more than any other country. You know, having lived in London, having lived in Italy. Um, and you have to pay for your insurance. The, 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 not as good, but but in France there is, and my and my sister and my mom, you know, both had cancer, and it's really they handle cancer patients incredibly well in France. I have to say, um, hundred percent covered. But the Lyme care is, you know, it it doesn't exist. You know, it's people are forgotten once again, um, and 
you know, it, 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 and Dr. Klinghardt, who's also a good uh, um, collaborator and 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 peer and um, wonderful person that we both work with, we've both worked with, and you know, he'll say all every day, like medicine is broken, medicine is broken, it's broken, it's broken, and it is. It's it's really very broken, and it's more broken today than it's ever been. So it's, it's getting worse. Yeah, and it's getting worse. So it's it's very difficult. This is really difficult but, topic. Yeah. So we started a program where um, you know treating vets for free, and uh, and the first vet, you know, it, they tend to be um, uh, special forces. This guy was a combat controller, um, and he basically had traumatic brain injury, uh, PTSD. Uh, he had a, a rod in his leg and he had allodynia, which is you can't even touch the skin. Uh, it's just so painful, like a sheet on it, which I had for a while, which I thought, you know, someone with that, you're like, mm, crazy, you know, but man, it's it's horrible. Very painful. Um, and then um, uh, within, so the, you know, the first visit, we got rid of his allodynia and oh, he couldn't even read a book, by the way. Oh, they found him, I should, I'm kind of all over the place, but they found him face down with no pulse um, and the heart failure, kidney failure. They put him in an induced coma, said he's probably not going to make it. So it, he had been for like eight years in and out of the VA system and, and all that. So I don't think they came to us somehow, but it's like we started to say we won't we won't charge anything. Uh, again, by the first day, his allergen, he couldn't flex his foot and he's just flexing it. And then uh, another uh, colleague like slaps his leg and his mom and me, I was like, what are you doing? And it didn't hurt, you know? And, and then by the second visit, he was so much better. He could read a book from cover to cover, anxiety much less. He went on a camping trip and being special forces, you know, a camping trip, no sleeping bag, you know, and just turned his life around. And so then someone heard about this and then a director heard about it and said, I want to do a documentary on this. And then he ended up getting funding for a 12 part series and distribution on like, I don't know, he names them all off, but I like Hulu, uh, Amazon Prime, uh, blah, 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 you know, uh, Netflix, no, no, not Netflix, I don't think yet, but, um, and so we're working on that right now and treating all, all these vets and they're, they're treated horribly. And I, and like, I went to a party and this guy was a vet and he's getting divorced, which is so common. And then he says, oh, yeah, the, the VA says nothing's wrong with me. And I'm like, um, you know, tell me your little, little bit of history, just very short. And I said, let me guess, you got that, 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 that. And he starts crying. No one's, how do you know that? And I said, that's what they all have. He goes, how, how do you know? The VA says it doesn't, you know, that, there's, that my symptoms, they've never seen it before. I'm like, oh, my God, you know. And this is what we find though. I said, come in, we're not gonna, we're not gonna charge you. They don't come in, you know? And I don't know if it's just like, hey, I wanna tough it out or um, not trusting her, or I don't know. But um, yeah, we're in, in the, the interesting thing is we're finding all these things are basically uh, uh, have the same, common underlying pathophysiology. You know, immune modulation is huge and mitochondria and you know, immunosenescence and, yeah. uh, and and all these things. And uh, like what you found with COVID, like 40% of uh, COVID, especially post-COVID patients have PTSD, you know, and it just affects it a little, little differently. Or and they have brain fog you know severe long covid and and yeah but that's not considered associated with it you know it's like so dr Alton, one of the things that we you know we deal with regularly on this podcast is uh the frustration that patients have with the time it takes to be diagnosed with lyme disease uh and there are a lot of different theories about why it takes so long to like 10 minutes. i'm sorry 10 minutes 
Well, yeah, well, it, it, you know, and it, and it didn't take you 10 minutes to diagnose yourself, which is sort of, I, I think, an important part of what we have to look at. Here, oh, right? yeah, it's it's like, and you go and you have a respected doctor, they go, or to show you, we had one um, very high powered CEO in Orange County, I diagnosed with Lyme, he's doing much better. He goes to his doctor, his doctor says, this is ridiculous, this is malpractice, there's no Lyme in California. And so he's calling, just panic. Well, what are you treating me with? Oh, you're feeling better. I know, but it's not that. And he said there isn't any Lyme. He was adamant. And then about two weeks later, his dog gets totally sick, brings him to the vet, and the vet says he's got Lyme disease. You know, and uh, so there, so there is this political overlay that that makes it um, challenging to diagnose it with Lyme. But let's. I, I want to explore something else with you, right? Because um you were sick right you were sick for a long time in fact you were sick for your entire life and um despite being a brilliant man who graduated from some of the top schools in the country who certainly wanted to make himself better you weren't able to diagnose yourself and how much of that was based on the failure of the educational system to give you the tools that you needed to properly diagnose yourself with Lyme disease oh great e question exactly because being evidence-based, you go, but here's the standard. Do this two-tiered test, and if you're negative, well, that's not it. And there's really no chronic Lyme. And you're just told all these false statements, to put it nicely, and so you don't think about it. But then as you get more and more and start reading more and more, and there's you know, and in fact, the Society of America still doesn't agree there's chronic Lyme. There's post-Lyme syndrome. Well, what about all these studies that, you know, they look and they find active, uh, you know, Lyme in, in the body when they have post-Lyme syndrome? Or, you know, McDonald, who was head of the um, Harvard Brain Bank, biopsied tons of Alzheimer's patients and found you know, basically Lyme disease and the majority of them, they wouldn't let him publish it because it would cause too much panic and everything's so political. And I think that's everyone's scared to lose their job um, because he would have probably been gone, you know, and it's. In but, the, but the political overlay is certainly a significant issue and we should explore that a little bit together, but that wasn't an issue for you. You were not politically limited in evaluating your own symptoms. You weren't afraid to um, evaluate yourself to get to a proper diagnosis. You simply couldn't think outside of the box because you were educated in a way yeah. that boxed you in. And because you were in that box, you couldn't diagnose yourself, which makes it that much more difficult for well-intentioned doctors to diagnose third parties. I mean, if they just can't think outside of that box to, to diagnose themselves, how are you going to diagnose patients who are certainly, you're yeah. certainly never and going to know as well as you know yourself. And you're certainly but, never going to know but, as well. And plus they're relieved when they turn up negative. Now they don't have to do anything. Um, but yeah, and so with me, it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, I was told this and you want to believe it, you believe it, I'm evidence-based, I'm not gonna, and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. you see more evidence, someone says something, you're like, well, that's not what I was taught. And then you go do the research and you're like, damn, wait a minute, that guy was more than right, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you find this, in even old research, and that really, the, I think you can basically for two months, go to the old research and be a better specialist than the specialist, you know, not surgery, but like gastroenterology, I mean, they're just scoping people, that's where the money is, like they just discovered probiotics as gastroenterologists, you know, Endocrinologist, if you have an endocrinology an endocrine problem, yeah, try to get your endocrinologist to help you. Um, they're diabetes doctors that give insulin. Uh, OBs, and I'm not trying to be disparaging, but they give birth control pills. They're supposed to be hormone experts. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they take out body parts. And we have found hiring doctors over the last, you know, 15, 20 years that it's, I'm depressed because more and more doctors, like, I don't like protocols. Doctors love protocols, patients love protocols. Um, and we got to do more of them, but I'm not a protocol guy. But 
um, that they don't understand, doctors don't understand concepts. They're taught, and maybe it's, that's how, you know, they're great book learners, great test takers, is they want to memorize and give me an algorithm. But that's also how they work because you have to go through an algorithm or if you screw it up, you're going to get brought in, uh, brought in front of the uh, board of the hospital. Insurance is going to cover it, da, da, da. So they're mm -hmm. made to think like that and it's their livelihood. You know, if they switch, they, they're going to, you know, get less money. Um, well, but there's also this balance of, of, of working with generally accepted medical practices and then knowing when you're supposed to determine whether or not your client or I'm sorry, your patient mm -hmm. is, um, is um, someone who is outside of the bell-shaped curve, is somebody who is, who is, who is... Um, I think they're inside the bell-shaped yeah. curve that has been misdiagnosed for years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And but, are, but from a, when you're a clinician, aren't you supposed to be using generally accepted medical practices? And then if you find that you have an outlier, then you should have the freedom to work with somebody who's an outlier. And I guess we get to find outliers um, in different ways, but an outlier work with is an outlier. Okay. Well, I don't think they're an outlier, really. Um, well, they're in within the bell curve. They're an outlier. They don't they, I mean, there's, I, I don't know how to stick so with people client. like them, but they just don't deny it. And it's like, you know, and, and they have the problem is they go to their doctor and says, oh, no, that's ridiculous. Um, Not and then, just their doctors. They go back to their family. Oh, and their family and say, oh, it's black and their doctor. their families who is are he? like, have to undo all of the conversations and education. Yeah. I mean, as an advocate, my job is to educa educate the family so that the patient you know, the client can get some peace in relationship to their treatment protocol or to their, you know, course of treatment ahead because they're going to be doubted so much that then they're going to continue. And, and, they're, and they're going to break and they're, and they're, they're spending, you know, money. And so that gets resentful. And once you speak to I mean, so many patients, is it, I've been to the best doctors, you know, it's chief of staff over here. People always go, I'm going to Mayo Clinic. I'm like, see, so, uh, see I, the you know, well, uh, yeah. so let, you, you cited the work of Dr. Alan McDonald, who's one of our favorite uh, doctors. Uh, we've interviewed him several times. And one of the things that Dr. McDonald's argued uh, is that we need a divorce from Lyme. And his argument is that by using this term Lyme disease, we're putting ourselves in a position where we have a disease without a definition. And because we have a disease without a definition, we start to have some challenges of even defining the problem. And one of the things that I was thinking of- when we, you I were, think we agree with that. Yeah. We'd and like it, to rebrand and, and when we say, when I say Lyme disease, it's kind of like Lyme disease. What is it really? We may be treating something very different. And there's so many infections coming out that- don't come up on blood tests and, mm -hmm. you know. So well, but you're not even testing for it, right? I mean, it's, right, I mean, you know, so, so, yeah, it's, so, you know, when, well, when we're, but let, so let's say with this, this chronic Lyme versus the post-treatment Lyme syndrome uh, divide, right? Um, isn't the real challenge that we don't have a definition for Lyme disease? The, we, I've had some doctors slap me across the hand and say, Richard, Lyme disease is Borrelia. And then I've had other doctors say to me, it's a polymicrobial infection, right? And we, so we have this multi-defined disease. And then couldn't we have someone who actually has chronic Lyme disease where they have active infections, but it's not the one infection they're looking for. And because it's not the one infection that they're looking for, now they're arguing that you have post-treatment Lyme syndrome rather than chronic Lyme disease. And are we in some cases really just looking at the same thing differently and defining it yes. differently because we don't yeah. have a consistent definition it's a semantic of Lyme disease? War. That's what I was going to say. It's and then not, you put it doesn't it make any by, sense, yeah. And it doesn't matter what you call it. And we Let's really- finish. Like we often won't even check for infections. We'll check the immune system, other markers. Then we, because a lot of people won't do the test. They, oh, I don't have that. I don't have that. CD57. And, and, and uh, but you want to get the activity. But, uh, uh, yes. but anyways, but, and then show them this is screwed up. And they'll say, 
I've been, everything's been normal. You know, what does your doctor check? The CBC, a chem panel, cholesterol, and they go, oh, your cholesterol's high. And just my, the TSH. And, and give it. them a statin, and they think, oh, my cholesterol's so low. Would you just increase the mortality of that person, increase their risk for heart yes, failure, uh, increase their risk for, yeah. yeah I mean, we um, think it's great guy. Yeah, Alzheimer's. You know, Dr. Dan, Dan, Dan Yen Gudnow, who does, I don't know if you know about prodrome science, and, you know, he does this amazing, he wrote this amazing book on Alzheimer's disease, and, you know, how plasmologens essentially prevent all these neurological conditions. And so he does this very interesting panel and, you know, he looks at people's, you know, everything in turn, and he also looks at people's cholesterol levels and he, anything that's below 200 cholesterol, they're at risk for neurological diseases, for yeah, cancer. You'd be surprised. These, all these doctors. It's consistent. Consistent. And then everybody's putting these people on statins because no, they're exactly. 205 or 210, you know, and then they're dropping to 150. And then you, we tell them your cholesterol is too low and they think we're crazy. It's Well, to show you, there was, you know, one study that showed, they looked at people's cholesterol levels, uh, you know, cholesterol, HDL, LDL, the other, other things, and fibrinogen. And if you had low fibrinogen, low risk for heart disease, didn't matter how high your cholesterol was, high fibrinogen, uh, you know, high risk, no matter what your cholesterol level was. So aren't we testing the wrong thing, you know? But there's a lot of money to be made in cholesterol. And it makes sense. See, people get it like, oh, the the you know the lipids you know basically collect on the uh, on the vascular wall that's not what happens you know um and they focus on the wrong thing you know i mean i mean we didn't get into a whole nutritional conversation but you know people are they're being told to be you know to stop eating meat to stop eating you know that everybody has to be vegan now we all have to and eat then, bugs because you know next week it's going to be yeah. and and you know and and nobody's allowed to eat you know, grass-fed butter anymore because, you know, you're going to die the high cholesterol, you should eat bugs, you should eat impossible burgers and, you know, and, and then everybody's eating, everybody's eating, you know, industrial seed oils. And you know, so it's just, so the, oh, yeah, which I, I think it's a nice transition to the last thing that I'd like to talk with you folks about, and you've been really, really kind with your time and, and, and we, we're going to uh, give you the opportunity to wind down, but there is one really important topic area that I'd like to explore with the two of you, and that is, that is um, you know, the, the, the risk of Lyme disease, right? Um, General Stanley McChrystal in his brilliant book, Risk, defined risk as um, threat times vulnerability. And, and it's it's one of the formulas that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about and using during the course of this podcast, where we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 500,000 people per year being diagnosed with um, Lyme disease. And we have in excess of 2 million people suffering currently in the US with, uh, with chronic Lyme. It's probably higher, but at least diagnosed with chronic Lyme disease. And we've, we've seen some recent studies that are showing that at least one in every 15 people in the world has Lyme disease, right? So we're, we're seeing these numbers explode. And so let's first talk about- the definition, like you were saying, mm -hmm. that now how many people have it? Yeah. Right, and on a very narrow definition, of course, you're right, certainly in the one in yeah. 15 study, right, worldwide, right? right? So let's first talk about the threat piece of this and then we'll talk about the vulnerability piece of this. So okay. first of all, the, the threat piece is we are more likely to come in contact with Lyme disease today than ever before. And we were debating a little about this offline about how uh, what is causing this increased threat in this risk formula. And you know, one of the one of the things that we focus on in this podcast in the past is, of course, because of global warming, the breeding window for six is extended and as a result of the breeding window being expanded there are just simply more ticks i'm not a big proponent of that i mean i think it plays a part but i think there's other things that play a much bigger part i will so let's get to that right so 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 i think it is clear and 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 i think the entomologists are, are certainly certainly been able to uh, prove with evidence-based research that there are more ticks and there there is has been an expanded um uh environment that is that is 
um, and, you know, that is hospitable to yeah. texts both north and south than there had been before. So there are certainly more texts. But let's talk about some of the other things that we were talking about uh, uh, offline, where you believe our exposure to Lyme disease is greater today than ever before. Yes. And I, I do think it has to do with, yeah, you know, with, with the extended number of ticks or invading. And, but that's really pushed highly because it's the thing, global warming, global warming. I'm more worried about toxins mm. uh, than- Okay, but, that's a, but isn't that really a vulnerability issue? The yeah, that might be a vulnerability issue, but let's, let's if, focus- Let's focus on the threat, meaning the likelihood of us yeah. coming in contact with the polymicrobial um, disease first. And, and I do want to talk about vulnerability, so, but let's talk about yeah. threat. So, so we have to we, go, we have to go back to, you know, term once again a semantics conversation. And we have to talk about tick-borne versus vector-borne, which is what we were talking about before, and how many vectors into the body are there. So you know, the only other really well-known, and I'm not going to only talk about Borrelia, but the only other really well-known spirochete is, you know, syphilis. And so, you know, syphilis is known to be sexually transmittable. Um, and, you know, there is no definitive and or really, nobody's fully stating that Lyme disease or Borrelia, and I mean, we can't, we've already talked about the difference between Borrelia and Lyme disease. So I'm going to leave that alone. But nobody's really saying, you know, outright that Lyme disease is sexually communicable. I think Lyme disease is sexually communicable. And if that's the case, that's a very well-known vector, potentially a, a more threatening vector than tick-borne. Well, so and, and the, the, I, I don't think it's fair to easy to say no one is saying that. I, I can tell well, you, Dr. No Alan is, McDonald has. Alan McDonald, uh, yes, I apologize. You're absolutely right. What did you say? What? So I, I, I made a, I made an incorrect statement, and that is that the statement that I made is no one is coming out and saying that Lyme disease is sexually transmissible because it's being said kind of more quietly in our inner circles because but the world no at large because i because because the world at large patients clients you know young people who are having sex and who are not necessarily using any kind of other protection because you know they because in some ways hiv or other stis don't seem threatening to them you know are getting tick-borne infections you know it's called vector-borne infections from having sex it I, is happening so so there's certainly some research that is suggesting that in the vaginal fluids and the sperm tests that have been done with one partner or the other who has been diagnosed with Lyme disease, it's substantially, it's it's very, very highly likely that when they're testing the the the, the fluids of the other partner, the other partner is testing positive. But have you noticed that they haven't followed up with those studies and see what the real transmission rate is? They don't want to know. Right. So, oh. and that's where we're splitting hairs. Like, that's why I said no one. And I am I was wrong to say that. You're absolutely right to call me out on that. But, but, and, but they, 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 look, there is some debate about that, right? So, for example, Dr. Fallon had argued that, you know, it, when, when he looked at that study, um, that the reason why the, both the male and the female partner were, were in that study were both likely to have um, you know, the bacteria, the Lyme bacteria really in their, in their uh, fluids is because they're living in tick endemic communities and they're likely they both have been bitten by, by ticks. Like, is that right? Is it wrong? I don't know, but it, also, it is certainly one of the things that we have to consider um, from vulnerability. What standpoint. about like, you know, two young people who hook up for 10 months and, you know, have and, and like, never been so, in any kind of tick you like know. both the, my, myself and my girlfriend or wife, Libby, uh, have Lyme disease. I blame her that she gave it to me, you know, and she blames me. Well, that's kind of weird. We're in a state that doesn't have Lyme. Well. You know, and, but I, I think, too, kind of with this um, in utero is that I think Next a lot factor. more people had it, but now with all the other environmental things it's coming out much more 
Okay, so let's let's get to vulnerability. I mean, I think there was a fourth prong that we talked about that I'd like to just touch on, which is uh, which is blood transfusions, right? At least here in New York, uh, you have to fill out a questionnaire about whether or not you have been diagnosed with uh, a tick-borne illness before you can donate blood. I understand that's not something that's national, but here in New York, we have to yeah, do that. Yeah, but they're going to say no, mm -hmm. you know, and because the doctor told them they don't have it, even if they have symptoms, and they very well may be asymptomatic. It's, and it's but at like, least we're asking here in New York, right? I mean, at least the questions being asked so that people who have been diagnosed can check the box and and, and not diagnose, not be not be donating. If you Obviously, ask, if, if people like have for, not been given a diagnosis, that's not going to help. Yeah, for like risk, have you had any homosexual interactions? I mean, the you know basically people saying no when they have is huge, you know, and uh, and and so I think. I mean, a little bit to start, but, but like, and they don't like Babesia in the um, uh, blood. Uh, you know, they weren't even checking for it. And the tests yeah. are terrible. Now, what about the spike protein all, on all the well, blood? Uh, now our blood's totally contaminated, but. So let's get to vulnerability because I know you're excited to talk about that. So why are we can more- I, Can I just add, before we move to that, in terms of the, uh, vertical transmission and you yes. basically you know we i've worked with a lot of different ob's now there are lyme literate ob's and there are not lyme literate ob's and i worked with clients that are pregnant and have positive igenics um igm igg variant you know and the ob's don't have you know and then lyme literate doctor might say you and i thought with this before you know, hey, you know, you're pregnant, you should, would be probably a good idea to protect the offspring to be on antibiotics throughout the pregnancy. Well, the OBs will say that it's dangerous, they can't do it, it's not okay, don't do it, don't do it. These are things we encounter on a regular basis. Yeah, or, or you think a threat, like, okay, our family, we weren't campers, like we hated the outdoors, we're in California, um like you know what was our threat I mean, everyone had it um, well because because 70 percent of the people who contract Lyme disease get it in their own backyard right the the the, right. the 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 bias is that you have to be an outdoorsy person or you have to be a camper or you have to be a hunter and that's simply not true the overwhelming majority of people who have come in contact with ticks come in contact with ticks in their backyard and I've shared with people on this podcast that I've been bitten by a tick every year for the last five years, at least yeah. one that I discovered biting me, all of which came from my backyard or one of my dogs that came in the house from our backyard and and, and, and sat on it. And we're in California where they're cats. saying there is no Lyme disease. Well, but but we know that's not true, right? We, cats, we know, you know, fleas, um, Bartonella, Bartonella flea, you know. Okay. Like cats, mosquitoes, you know. Well, yeah, again, reckless. So let's talk about vulnerability now, right? Because this is this is another piece of it, right? Because we do know that humans have been coming in contact with the Lyme bacteria, at least again, Borrelia, for um, for as long as there have been humans. You know, Doctor yeah, Bill, Iceman, Bill, for example. And, and What's that? The Iceman. That they right, so we know actually the Ice Man, who, who was fifty three hundred years old, had had uh, you know yeah, had well. Lyme disease, but it actually predates uh, Ed to the Ice Man. So, which suggests that because humans have been coming in contact with this bacteria for as long as we have been, we do have immune defenses to it. Right on the virility scale, it's pretty low, and we should be able to protect ourselves at least against this one bacteria. I think it changes when we are looking at a polymicrobial disease, which let's put that aside for now. Mm -hmm. But but as it as it relates to the vulnerability, we are more vulnerable today than we've ever been before. Some of it is lifestyle, some of it is diet. I mean, we have all those. So let's let's build that out together. Why are we more vulnerable to this, uh, to uh, suffering from a chronic disease that traditionally we've had the ability to manage as part of our microbiome uh, well yeah my thought again is i think stress and the levels are just out of control right now all the toxins and it ends up lowering immunity and that's what it comes out so i think most people that get lyme never have symptoms especially years ago uh, because they have good immune systems and all that, 
and I don't want to get the vaccine debate, but you know, it's like we check natural killer cell function and people got vaccinated. Every time they got vaccinated, it went lower and lower. Mm -hmm. And now they're finding like the derms are saying huge melanomas in young people, the OBs, like weird cancers, cervical cancers. Um, and uh, it's, it, it, it's a problem. And you know, we're big on the immune system, immune dysfunction. We figure when we fix that, many of these things fix themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting what you're saying. And I've been thinking about this more and more. And I've been working with a number of practitioners. Right now, there's so much going on in terms of, uh, you know, um, circadian rhythm health, um, circadian rhythm dysfunction and deuterium and deuterium depletion. And if you listen to Stephanie Seneff and you listen to James Leff and there's, you know, I'm currently doing um, a course with the Dutch university and I work with this, uh, another wonderful ND by the name of Petra Dorsman and their conversations are very much about, you know, how are we depleting deuterium and how are we no longer denaturing ourselves in human, you know, form in, in our humanity? And unfortunately, we're living in a culture, you know, where there is just so much focus and emphasis on denaturing ourselves more and more. And, you know, getting back to, you know, sunlight, you know, we we everybody's, you know, covering themselves with toxins so they don't get any sun you know and there's all this you know propaganda about how you know healthy food is not healthy and all this stuff so we are becoming denatured and we are becoming more toxic and and we know we know because when we see people who have high levels of heavy metals um glyphosate we see all of this they have much higher levels of bacteria you know, and these things polarize to each other. And then you got the, you know, microbiome, of course, and all of this stuff. And, stuff. and, then, and then, you know, patients in general, are like, well, I don't want to deal with this detoxing thing. I just treat my, my infections. We're like, well, we can't actually treat your infections if we don't treat your toxin load, because you'll never actually unravel this Rubik's cube that you have put together, you know, by being on this planet for 35 years. And, and this is a concept that's very difficult to help people understand. So with cancer patients, you know, more and more deuterium depletion could actually be one of the most and only treatment course that you go through for long term where you could eradicate cancer fully. And there's so many things like that. And they're all, you know, obviously, you know, uh, basically multifactorial. And you get something like that that no one's really heard about and how important it is. Then you got a thousand things like that. And it's just adding up, adding up, adding up one more, you know, yeah. one more thing. Um, or it's like, like we treat ALS and we've had ALS patients come in wheelchairs, they're jogging and they go back to the neurologist and they go, oh, it must have been this diagnosis or a miracle, you know. Um, I haven't seen one who hasn't had Lyme. Or who hasn't had a high level of toxicity. So Dr. Altov, I'm going to ask you one final question. You've been very, very generous, both you and Daisy, with all of your your expertise and your brilliance. Uh, but um, I, I'd like to talk to you about the HPA axis. Um, I know you. I know you know a great deal about the HPA axis, and you've written a great deal on it. Um, can you give us your thoughts on the impact that um, stress is having on the HPA axis? And the impact that stress is having first on um, cortisol receptors, the impact that the stress is having on, on, on the uh, adrenaline, and what impact that's having on our ability to heal when we are managing uh, the Lyme, um, the polymicrotic disease that we call Lyme disease. Uh, yeah, uh, good, good question. So I did a review uh, a while ago now, um, HP axis dysfunction and chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Looked at all the research and found that when they did appropriate testing, like the central test that would you know, stimulate, and da, 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 but the standard ACH stimulation test is ridiculous. It, it's like hitting someone with a hammer and going, do you have pain? But, um, and uh, found that 
the overwhelming majority, 90%, had um, HP axis dysfunction with chronic syndrome of fibromyalgia. When we found that the fibromyalgia patient had more um, hypothalamic dysfunction and the chronic fatigue syndrome patients had more pituitary sure. dysfunction, makes sense of the pain center and stuff there. But it it is a problem, I think sometimes maybe a little too much emphasis because it, it's all the hormones and it's, you know, it's pineal, hypothalamic, pituitary, then all these hormone dysfunctions, um, including, you know, thyroid, low, low thyroid with low TSH and high T4, which everyone says, oh, that's high thyroid. You know, that's what depressed patients, that they'll have low, low normal TSH, high normal T4. And the doctor's like, see, they're hyperthyroid. Then they give them T4. So you see, it didn't help. It, um, uh, it wasn't hypothyroidism. Well, let's look at the STAR report. Largest study ever done on antidepressants showed that T3 was a better antidepressant, regardless of their levels, than antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, another study, 135 treatment-resistant bipolar patients. They tried on average 14 different medications with no response. They gave them um, high-dose T3, didn't matter what their levels were. 80 plus percent responded and I think it was 25 or 30 percent total resolution of symptoms, you know. And now mm -hmm. and with the adrenals, we have found that we don't do a lot of specialized, but um, we found because if you give like epitalin and pineal peptides that it's interesting, uh, like with a rat, you can even, they took out their pituitary gland even up a town and their thyroid levels normalized, you know? So, and that kind of fixes itself. And, but if you see also, let's say someone has, uh, with stress, high ACTH, the body's pumping out corticotropin releasing hormone. And you'll see patients with a high ACTH, but a low cortisol. And what that tells you is they have high CRH, which is a huge stimulator of mast cells. Um, and so it kind of goes around and around. So we find if you have that, you want to give them a little cortisol um, uh, to, to lower that until you get things under control. But yeah, adrenal, and people think cortisol is bad, but it really helps you deal with stress. Like if you have, and it depends, if you're totally relaxed and in good health, you can have low cortisol and be fine. If you're in the ICU and you have a normal cortisol level, you're going to die, you know? And, but I think it's just kind of also the stress patterns, the sleep patterns, we've screwed it up and, and you get basically a flat line, you know, mm -hmm. or you get peaks at the wrong time. Um, but that we find, I, I think peptides are great for kind of fixing those. Um, but we'll use a little cortisol here and there, uh, and adrenal, you know, supplements and, and things like that. Um, and, uh, in fact, I think the adrenal supports are number one product. So mm -hmm. obviously it's an issue. People wouldn't buy it and keep buying it and feel better. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think it's an issue. It's also kind of about testing. Um, you know, we'll just do a, a morning cortisol, the, uh, Brazilian Journal of Infectious Disease showed that if a person who has a chronic infection has a morning cortisol less than 12, there's like an 87% chance that they have adrenal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll look at that. Some uh, occasionally we'll do, you know, like the saliva, so you can do it multiple times and, and see what it is. But I find, you know, I don't want to get in that debate uh, because every test has its pluses and minuses, you know, um, and, but we'll, we'll use it when, when we need it. I think you can send people astray sometimes, um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think it's an issue, but it's like people will put, so like adrenal fatigue, adrenal fatigue, which I you know, you'll hear kind of, I'm nothing against chiropractic, but they'll use it a lot. So it got a bad name of just like kind of quackery. And I was uh, supposed to do a debate in the Journal of Endocrinology about is there adrenal fatigue? But I really blew it by giving all this information up front. And they're like, well, wait, wait, wait. 
this is too pro and he has too much fat, too many facts, I think. So mm -hmm. then they're like, no, we'll get some help. Uh, but um, uh, it, it, it's an issue as are all the hormones. And I mean, that's the thing. It's a multi-system illness. And the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. You know, and, 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 and it's dangerous to segregate a system and focus on a system when it's a, a you know, a, a polymicrobial disease that's going to affect many, many systems in different ways and different people. And that's, of course, one of the challenges of Lyme. So let me ask you the final question so I can let you two folks go after, again, being so kind with uh, all of your information and experience. So Dr. Waldorf, if at the end of this um, podcast on the way home, when Daisy's driving you home, you discover that she has a tick biting her. What would you recommend that she do so she wouldn't have to um, go on a chronic Lyme disease journey? Um, well, you remove it as soon as you can. Um, and then I would almost always treat with triple antibiotics um, and uh, for an extended period of time because I think it's kind of that risk threat thing that, okay, well, what's the risk of taking antibiotics versus if you get chronic Lyme, you're not happy, you know? So uh, I am on the side of aggressive treatment. Um, and I know that that's another very controversial area. Mm -hmm. So what if if you were to diagnose, uh, I mean, if you were to recommend the, um, you said triple antibiotics, would there be any other uh, recommendations you would, you would make for folks who would be taking those antibiotics to offset the impact that, it, for example, may have on, on the person's gut health? Oh, yeah. You got an hour, you know, so <laughs> yeah, it's when I, when I say things that I doesn't mean we're not doing a ton of other things, it'd be you know, uh, peptides to uh, immune modulate, mitochondrial boosters, like ozone, yes, um, yeah, probiotics, IgG orally, um, yeah, maybe stem uh, cells. Yeah, stem cells. I mean, all these things. So it's very individualized because, you know, I wish I could give everything to everyone, but, um, you know, that's not practical. But yeah, always not just take this and we find like, for instance, when we do use antibiotics now that we can give much lower doses like for a shorter period of time. Um, and because if you have no immune system, you're gonna have to take this for five years or whatever, but maybe three months would be fine. You know, when, when you get everything else working, but very good question. Um, and yeah, almost always we're doing a lot of stuff and we're we're trying to get that plasma phoresis machine which i love and and, and yeah and so what was in there and the doctor's like this is heavy metals it was a lot um and then these are you know organic toxins and these are immune complexes i'm like holy crap you know it's so much and that was just you know one and then another, another treatment so we're just loaded with this stuff all right. So Dr. Altoff, can you please just share with our folks as we as we wind down uh, where they could get in touch with you if they wanted to work with you first in your medical practice? And I'd like you to talk a little bit about your your uh, your um, I don't know if it's a pharmaceutical company or a or a supplement company. I'd like you to define that as well, because I think you've done some great work on both prongs. So first, give the names of your of your of your companies and then how folks could um, um, yeah, access so Resources. So our main clinic is Holtorf Medical Group, holtorfmed.com uh, in El Segundo. You know, we kind of treat everything that the doctor can figure out, we'll, we'll treat it. We also do, you know, typical, uh, you know, it, it's funny how many people's lives we change with just giving a little thyroid. Or even Lyme patients who've been struggling, we've seen the best doctors and like, you know, your thyroid's really low. And they're like, oh my God, that was it, you know um but so we treat a lot of stuff um we're uh, basically an immune modulatory clinic we love peptides and that's you know kind of from my story uh love ozone we use you know a lot of supplements as well um you know different medications we're kind of getting into the which transfers over to chronic illness is 
the longevity, biohacking, growth, you know, stem cells, um, and, uh, you know, um, what else do we do? I for, forget half the stuff all the time. But, um, and, and that's a problem too, like 85% of our patients don't know 85% of the stuff we do. And, uh, and they'll go, oh, I just got this treatment. Oh yeah, we've had that for 15 years, you know. Um, but, uh, and then we, uh, you know, really being into peptides is seeing the huge benefit and then using on patients seeing the huge benefit. And we had uh, uh, originally 32 centers around the country with the fibro and fatigue center. But that was my first taste of corporate medicine. And so it was a guy who was an entrepreneur in, in uh, the medical space. He had terrible fibromyalgia and went to all the experts he could find, just treated like crap, to be honest. Like he flies out to one place and the doctor won't come out of the room because he didn't get his check. And he's like, it's right there. Well, no, no, we didn't do the FedEx in the FedEx thing. No, 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 we didn't, we didn't cash it. So it doesn't count. I mean, just the cruelty. But he came out to our center and within a visit and then two visits, he was dramatically better and said, we need to bring this to the rest of the world. And so uh, said, oh, this is great. Let's open all these centers. I learned that I hate managing, uh, you know, other doctors and it's, it, it's, it, it, it's a pain, but then, uh, they got funding and then so which came with that is a, a board and they'd be saying these things like i'm like dude this is not you know target this is a medical practice and they're just like you don't have a harvard mba you're just a doctor you know like, <laughs> yeah and so i ended up leaving i trained dr Teitelbaum to take over um and then the board fired the two people I started it with, and uh, within six months, they were out of business, you know. Um, but we thought we found the fatal flaw because the problem is you have corporate centers, you have a doctor's working, and they, you know, it, it's hard work. And people say, oh, you're in it for the money. If you're in it for the money, you don't want to be treating Lyme. No. It's, there's a lot easier ways to make money. Much easier. But so the doctors will kind of go, and then you can't, it takes a year to train a minimum uh, you know, trying to train them, you got to shut down the, the center. So we did, let's make franchises where they got a piece, you know, they have an incentive to stay around. But I found even with an incentive, they don't do, they don't listen and they pay their franchise fee, but then they're like, no, I don't want to do that. Like you're paying for the advice. So anyways, we uh, let most of them go, some bought out, some, we, you know, said, by. We have one left in, in Atlanta, um, but uh, uh, so we're, we're kind of, I may join Forum Health um, as kind of a, uh, you know, whatever C-level thing and over overseeing the clinical part. Um, and they're really into, I wouldn't have to manage. I'm a terrible manager. I am too nice. Uh, it drives me crazy. And when I kind of had to step back from patients to become a manager, you think, well, okay, I'm moving up. I hate this. I want to, I want to see patients, you know. But you know, how many patients can I can I see? Um, so kind of for the greater good. And that's what they're into is the greater good, which uh, so we're really jiving with, with them. So that may may happen soon. And we're starting a training program. Uh, for doctors, and then she's going to run the one for health uh, uh, coaches advocates, and advocates. Coaches. Um, uh, so that's starting in hopefully February. Uh, we have the um, integrative peptides, which is a supplement peptide company. So people can get it on their own. We, rec we want them to go to their doctor. Their doctor can get them a better deal. Um, you know, and uh, so kind of an incentive to go see a doctor and chiropractors can uh, can use it. I mean, they're just exceedingly safe, which which is nice. And uh, so we've been doing that. That's been going well. We just keep running out of product uh, is the problem. And then we kind of have our, I wish I would have built it up more over the years, but 
you know, the goal was with the National Academy of Hypothyroidism was to uh, basically train doctors and sophisticated patients on the way we practice medicine in this kind of practice thyroid treatment and diagnosis and treatment is wrong. And you know, a couple of review articles that have 500 references, but they're still TSH, 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 you know, and it's probably the worst tissue to look at, you know, unless you're totally healthy, have no stress, no toxins, no body infections. But other than that, it's a bad thing to, to look at. Um, started a biopharm company um, for all my sins, but uh, to do clinical trials and all these things. But we're always doing kind of, you know, pseudo clinical trials that are very safe. And uh, I love coming up with new compounds and um, of course, I take as much as I can to like and do the toxicity studies right there, but it, they're shown to be safe anyways. But um, and I, I, I like doing that. I love research and, uh, you know, developing things, but I also love seeing patients. But it's like, you know. Many... Only so many hours in a day, but it is wonderful that you're doing as much work as you're doing. And I can't thank you enough for spending so much time with us. And we're really excited that you and Daisy are going to be working together on a training program. Uh, that's something we've been encouraging Daisy to think about as well. So it's wonderful that uh, you're going to be uh, working together on that. So again, thank you so much for spending time with uh, us here at Take Bootcamp. And, and I know the folks in our community are really going to be blessed when they have an opportunity to hear um, all the wonderful things that the two of you shared with us. So thank you and, uh, and good night. Keep your eye out for the documentary coming out. Um, and we'll, we'll send you a little, some clips. And uh, I'd love to uh, kind of get together with you and uh, learn more about your organization um, and see how we can collaborate. And I've learned that, you know, I first started like, I don't want to tell people what I do and they're going to be a competitor. Ridiculous. I mean, you can't even spoon feed them. Um, and so I think collaboration is the way to go and, uh, you know, helping each other. We can just reach so many more people, um, love your style and, uh, and, thank you and, and, and so much doing. for so it's been an honor spending so, all this time with us tonight. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate both of you and, uh, and, and you're really doing God's work and thank you for continuing to bless everyone. So we'll, uh, thank you and, and wish you well. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to our TIG Bootcamp interview with our guest, Dr. Kent Holtorf. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Holtorf, check out his website at holtorfmed.com and drkentholtorf.com. Second, if you've enjoyed this episode of our TIG Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends on social media. Third, TIG Bootcamp has created a TIG by Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past podcast guests. We urge you to visit our website at tickbootcamp.com slash bite to view the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. Please take a minute to leave us an honest review on your podcast platform of choice. And finally, if you'd like to search our podcast library of almost 350 episodes, subscribe to our email list, or share feedback with us, please visit our website at tickbootcamp.com. Thank you as always, for listening.